Hi, I'm Johnny Roger, and it's an honour to be invited by the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service to give a talk introducing the architecture and history of Parliament House in Edinburgh. Parliament House is right in the heart of the city, just off the high street uh, to the south of St Giles Kirk. This prominent public building embodies in a unique and symbolic way a whole nexus of historical relationships in civil Scotland and also with civic Edinburgh. On the face of it, the name itself, Parliament House, may present it as a confusing institution to many people. Why is it called a parliament, you might ask, if it is indeed just a set of law courts? Why call the new Scottish Parliament building, built in 2003, a parliament, if there is already a parliament building here since the 17th century? And why are both these buildings of very different function, if you like, referred to as parliaments? What do they have in common? Or is there a special relationship between these two buildings and institutions? The source of any confusion regarding these questions probably arises from a misunderstanding of the modern custom and practice of the separation of legal powers in the state, whereby legislative and executive powers, in other words, the parliament and government, are kept separate from judicial powers and processes, or in other words, the law courts. This is a relatively modern development in European democracies, generally brought into being in the post-Napoleonic period, so from the beginning of the 1800s, round about then. Until then, until then, all functions of the, and powers of the law were generally exercised in the same places and generally with the same personnel. That, I would say, is that might be an explanation for this building's name as Parliament House that would satisfy most people, I would say, the confusion they, uh, they labour under. Um, although now it is simply the home of the highest courts in the land where serious legal questions and, uh, are settled and resolved and serious crimes are tried, um, it was formerly, it formerly housed all the functions of the law, including the Scottish Parliament, which sat there until the Union of Parliaments in 1707. So let's take a look at the building itself. And I'm gonna show you some images here and we can discuss the architecture and the styles of the building. Um, let me just share something here with you. Okay. Right, so we see here a sketch of the original Parliament House, and obviously nowadays it looks very different from that. It was first designed and built by James Rothy May in 1649, and it was actually paid for at a cost of £10,555 by Edinburgh Town Council. The Town Council were evidently very worried that if they didn't provide accommodation for the state and crown powers, then these institutions would simply move elsewhere. And thus great power and prestige would be lost to the city. As such, this constitutes a typical Baroque formation of a capital city. A capital city as the concentration of all state power over one territory in one urban area. And that follows the pattern set by Pope Sixtus V's rebuilding of Rome some 80 or so years earlier in the mid 16th century. As you can see from this contemporary drawing, the architecture of the building, original building, uh, is of its time and place. Scottish Renaissance, replete with uh, bartizans and with ogival domes, with uh, decorative strap work along the facade of the building, and with a decorative and carved um, doorway there. Um, if we look now at the interior of the building, okay, let's go up to the next slide. Uh, here we see uh, an etching by Billings in the um, 1830s. Um, this is the main space in the interior, which is referred to, so the whole building is referred to as Parliament House. This is referred to as Parliament Hall. So this is uh, where the Parliament itself, the 17th century Parliament would convene. 
It's also where the courts would be held in this space, as well as many other events of national importance. It's a relatively simple, as you can see, simple, large, open, utilitarian space. Although it's virtuoso Danish oak hammer beam roof, which you can see here, um, <clears throat> gives it a type of spectacular magnificence, we might say. Apart from that roof, there wasn't much decoration in, in the hall. It was kept relatively simple, as we can see in this um, uh, etching made 200 years after it was built. There has, however, also always been a very strong carving tradition in Scotland from early times on, and that is evidenced here too. So, um, for example, on that doorway, which we saw just a moment earlier there in the previous slide, there are carved figures on either side of it, carved figures of justice and mercy. This is the figure of justice, which originally appeared on the doorway. But these figures were removed by uh, Cromwell. Uh, he had them removed and they can, uh, at the moment, they can be seen in the uh, corridor behind the screen, which supports the wonderful von Kolbach uh, stained glass of 1868. Um, so both of these statues are sitting currently in that corridor on display there, can be seen there. Um, <clears throat> there are also other evidences of that uh, great carving tradition. So for example, in the stone corbels, that is the stone supports that support that timber beam roof, we can see these stone corbels have been carved in many different um, <clears throat> forms, so a series of grotesques and human faces and even architectural type uh, carving there. We see a, what looks like a castle there up in the top right hand side. Um, <clears throat> So there was quite an evidence of, of uh, sculptural work on the original 17th century building. But over the centuries, the exterior of the building has been completely reworked. So it no longer looks like that original slide I showed you there. And uh, at least on its pr principal facade, it is completely different. Um, so, and it looks more like this now. This is uh, a drawing from, um, now when it's from, the late 19th century from 1889 by Shepherd, and we can see the west end of the building as it looks now and uh, we can see that it has in fact um, got a kind of what we might call a new town style neoclassical sandstone frontage um, with a channeled arcade and with um, ionic columns on the which go through the first and second floors. Um, <clears throat> this elegant frontage design was first built in 1803 by, uh, designed by Robert Reed, the architect Robert Reed, and it has now extended around the whole south side of Parliament Square. Um, it was extended in 1838 when yet more um, <clears throat> specialist accommodation was added to the interior. So the building now is much, it has a different facade, it is now much bigger than the original. There's been much more interior accommodation added to it. And we can see a bit of that if we look at the plan of the, the current plan of the building as it now exists, which we see here. Um, so this is a very complex, irregular plan, as you can see, because the building has been extended and added to since it's, uh, was originally built in the 17th century. The original extent of the building can be seen in the gray shaded area. So we see how much bigger is the building in fact. Um, and we can see that most of the additions to the building, so you can see, you can see my cursor here, are specialist courtrooms. So the first division courtroom here, the high, the, the courtroom of the high court of the ju judiciary, Justiciary, sorry, um, the second division court. These these rooms here, 12, 13, 14, are all courts. Um, six, seven, eight, these are the most recently built courts. Five, four and five, these are also courts. So what we have is a move away from a general utility space towards specialist courtrooms. Um, and in fact, in an 1890s painting by C. Martin Hardy, there was an attempt to imagine what the uh, Parliament Hall would have looked like 
when it was used for court cases and for court in session. Here we can see lots of little court cases being heard by judges, advocates, sheriffs, and so forth. And also we can see on the right hand side, the little recesses where judges often used to sit to hear their cases. So many different cases going on at the same time in this one large utilitarian space of Parliament Hall. Um, these recesses, as you can see here on the right hand side, were um, <clears throat> uh, so designed, uh, were given a kind of uh, neo-Gothic timber design in the 1820s. Um, okay, so by 1844, however, um, no more legal cases were heard in Parliament Hall in this big open space. Instead, we moved to having all the court cases. So rather than have court cases be heard, like as in that image there, in the big open space of Parliament Hall, the court cases actually moved to the individual separate specialist courtrooms that were being built gradually over the years. We can look at a couple of these um, courtrooms now. So if I get up another slide. Um, this, for example, is the First Division courtroom, which we saw in the plan there, designed by Robert Reed again in 1838. So again, just before the cutoff in 1844, when the Parliament Hall was no longer used for court cases. And this one here. Um, so again, in both these courts, we see timber um, <clears throat> courtrooms, with um, benches for the public and for the, um, uh, and also we see the, the bench for the, the, with the red bays on it there, the red velvet there for the judges and so forth. Um, <clears throat> so rather elegant um, courtrooms, I think you would agree, uh, with Corinthian columns there, holding up the, uh, the uh, balcony there. Um, <clears throat> Anyway, these are the sort of courtrooms that were built, uh, that have been built all around Parliament Hall in corridors leading off from Parliament Hall. So Parliament Hall, and I think we've got an up-to-date picture of it now, this is what Parliament Hall looks like now, largely the same, but we'll come back to that in a second. Parliament Hall thus now holds neither a Parliament nor court hearings or sessions. So without such legal functions, the hall is now, or the hall now largely serves as leisure and decoration, if you like, within Parliament House. What I mean by that is that the relief of the open space from the tense, closed atmosphere of courtrooms for the advocates and the clients, where they can go there and discuss their case before the case or after the case and so forth. Um, this is the sort of thing it's used for now. And it's much more decorative as well. We see here, we see a really beautiful uh, photograph of that uh, hammer beam, uh, timber hammer beam roof. And the walls are now much more decorated in terms of holding portraits and so forth of former judges and advocates and people who have uh, been part of the history of Parliament House and, of course, part of the history of the Scottish legal tradition. Um, there is also in evidence, again, further development of that sculptural tradition that I spoke of with, for example, um, uh, statues, carved statues of um, uh, Lord President Forbes here from 1752, a Baroque statue, a particularly fine Baroque statue here, um, which shows him, if you like, holding court as he might have done formerly in the Parliament Hall, as he would have done, in fact. And we also have a Green Shields 1832 sculpture of Sir Walter Scott who also worked in the courts, of course, as a, an advocate and as a sheriff. Um, both uh, of these uh, figures did or must have at one point held court in the Parliament Hall itself. So what we see here is that with almost 400 years of history having rolled out between these walls, Parliament House continues to play a central role in Scotland's legal, judicial, political and democratic life. New courtrooms were added in the 1990s to the southeast of the complex. And again, the new facade of the Cowgate to the Cowgate keeps up the incremental 
date updating of Scottish styles by vaunting a then fashionable, in the 1990s, fashionable Macintosh geometric take on the Scottish baronial style, which you see here. So this is the where the three new courts were built. And you see that kind of 1990s, as I say, Macintosh style, Scottish baronial style. But perhaps a more significant sign and symbol of its role in Scottish society is the fact that in the new parliament, completed at the foot of the Royal Mile in 2003, the Catalan architect, Enric Morales, chose to design an updated postmodern version of that 17th century timber hammer beam roof, which clearly riffs off, or if you like, reconvenes the original parliament house. In that way, the new building, which Morales built, makes material the continuity of uh, Scottish political life and sets an appropriately symbolic physical stage for what Winnie Ewing, former MSP, referred to as the reconvening of the Scottish Parliament as it sat in 1999 for the first time in the city for nearly 300 years. So in many ways, this building, Parliament House, not only embodies a great deal of Scottish history, but it also bears influence on the present and looks to the future too.